So, can I invite questions in the audience, please? Okay. Please, no. Thanks. I have a question. Uh, I'm going to go back to the I know nothing about sound catch rates at all, but it seems to me like this is a very dynamic system. We're not going to be in any kind of equilibrium for a while. Is it possible to come up with a sound catch rate without an equilibrium? Um, I don't know. We don't, I don't even think there's enough data to answer that question. Um, among other things, there has, because there's been no fishing there, we have no, as we have the fish managers call it, fishing dependent data. And frankly, it's really a hard area to do other kinds of marine scientific research also. So I think the answer to your question is, I don't know. And, and I'm, not just, I'm not the only one who wouldn't know. Other questions, please. I have a question for for Tim. Um, with various types of data integration solutions, um, innocuous pieces of information could be put together to form something that is of, of certain concern to governments. You know, in the sense, you take ammonia and chlorine, which are innocuous fluids under your sink, you put them together, you get a poisonous gas. So the justification under security could be effectively applied to any form of information that's publicly available today. How do we deal with that? I, I'm going to have the same answer. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know because it's so um, context specific. I think it depends on the use and how it's governed. I think different, also the standards of what is uh, confidential and private varies from place to place. I mean, what we would consider private information may not be private information somewhere else, so it's going to vary from place to place. Um, so I don't know, it, it, it sort of depends on if there's a, um, if there's a move, move, toward, move toward a collaborative partnership of some sort, that's what those partnerships figure out, what data is going to be allowed, what data is not going to be allowed. The, the trick is, um, whether it's allowed or not, it very often can happen anyway. If the data is available, then people can, um, you know, data can be linked, and it, it currently is. In the United States, you can buy a lot of data that most people would be quite surprised to find that you can buy if you're a hospital or if you're a research company. Um, so there's a lot of information that's already out there in the commercial sector and is available, uh, which may uh, kind of contradict what a nation would feel is, is confidential information. Other questions, please? Yes. I have a question for Christina, uh, specifically regarding the role of civil society in regulating biodiversity <coughs> and the role that they're playing in the United Nations, uh, specifically with the major groups. If you can comment on that. That's, well, the NGOs have formed something called the High Seas Alliance, and it is participating in the major group discussions on the sustainable development goals. That's their other groups. But there hasn't been a huge amount of participation outside the High Seas Alliance, which is 30 organizations, including IUCN, uh, plus some scientific organizations. It's Greenpeace, WWF, uh, NRDC, and the, the usual sub suspects. Um, but there is definitely a need for greater civil society input into these discussions. That, um, you know, it affects the, the core species, the core uh, activities that we're dealing with, as well as sort of the common future that we all share. So I'd love to see more involvement. So a question in the back, please. Yes. Hi, uh, Richard Blouse, uh, science and environmental journalist. And uh, I'd like to ask for uh, Professor Gajard and Ambassador Ball. I've interviewed them once before. You gave the sketch of the Baltic for uh, fisheries and the American vision. How about for oil and gas? And what are your, both your concerns for that? The Arctic, I guess. Well, you mean the, the Arctic? Arctic, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not sure where to start. So um, some of you may know a very significant percentage of the world's untapped oil and gas lies north of the Arctic Circle, um, roughly half under land and half under marine areas of the ocean, or so USGS would have us believe. Uh, a lot of that's in Russia. But very little of it that we know of is uh, beyond 200 miles from shore. And in the Arctic, on the seafloor, there's probably very little um, space that's beyond national jurisdiction, as we already heard. Um, there are very serious concerns about what 
oil and gas development in the Arctic, particularly offshore, could mean for the environment, both immediately if there were a major spill. Imagine the Deepwater Horizon event happening in the Arctic. It would have been phenomenally worse and to try to clean up. And of course, uh, the development of hydrocarbons in the Arctic or elsewhere accelerates the very warming that the Arctic is experiencing. And yet there is no international agreement currently that would limit or even in any meaningful way regulate the way individual nations make decisions about whether to develop hydrocarbons in the Arctic and if so, how. Here in the United States, there's a lively debate going on. I'm sure you've been following it. Um, with, uh, pitch battles uh, uh, from some who say there should be absolutely no uh, hydrocarbon development in the U.S. Arctic, at least offshore or on land, some would say, and others who uh, would strongly advocate uh, that it happen. I can tell you that in Russia, in Canada, in uh, Greenland, there are um, desires to develop oil and gas. Uh, through the Arctic Council, this group of eight Arctic countries, there were developed some guidelines a few years ago to recommend best practices. There is also a binding agreement on um, uh, coordinating preparedness and response for oil pollution incidents in the Arctic in hopes of um, dealing with spills should they occur. But this is a tough issue, and I don't know what its future will hold. Watch this space. Yeah, I would just point out, I would totally agree with what Ambassador Bolton has said and um, suggest that many people are saying that oil just should just remain in the ground uh, where it is. It's a great storehouse there. Um, but ironically, with seabed mining, under the Law of the Sea Convention, the rules developed by the International Seabed Authority will set a global baseline for how seabed mining is conducted within national waters. That's uh, at least with respect to pollution control. So there was this question of um, balance of power and national versus international in interests when the Law of the Sea Convention was being negotiated, where national laws are supposed to be no less effective than the international laws for seabed mining, but there's no consistency or coherency at the national level with respect to oil and gas. And then as a result, you have very disparate standards from Norway to Nigeria and it becomes a very major problem. Other questions? Yes, please. Um, one of the oldest conflicts between Korea and Japan is the problem of Dokdo. And as you can see, I call it Dokdo in Korea. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think still science can um, be helpful to solve that kind of history problem? Can you translate it? Um, Dokdo Island? It's an island that both uh, Korea, South Korea, and Japan claim as their own. And it's hardly the only such example in the world of uh, pieces of land that more than one country claim. There's even a piece of land in the Gulf of Maine that the US and Canada both claim, a Chaya Seal Island. Any Canadians in the room? No, well, well, we're right and they're wrong about that. Um, I don't think, if you're asking me, I'm not sure who you're asking, if you're asking, <laughs> I wouldn't say that science is likely to solve this problem. However, um, some of the consequences that flow from these disputes over land have um, a, a effects that scientists can help us understand. So for example, because maritime areas depend on sovereignty over land, uh, a, a dispute over a piece of land, particularly an island, will uh, mean a dispute over the waters around it too. And that can mean that the waters are not properly regulated. And there can be overfishing or pollution or other sorts of things that scientists can help explain, draw attention to, and maybe, maybe just maybe, prompt governments to resolve these types of disputes. Just uh, in the best of all possible worlds in the Antarctic, in the Southern Ocean, for example, governments did agree to set aside their territorial disputes and to manage the area as a reserve for peace and scientific research. It does provide some strand of hope that other contested areas may uh, give rise to similar agreements. Um, Antarctica maybe didn't have the same ancient history of disputes and, and problems. But as we're seeing, many of these areas do need sound and rational management, or all sides of the dispute will suffer, as well as the neighbors. Um, so at 
be scientists can help. Yes, please. Um, I'm uh, Eli Kintish with Science Magazine. Uh, there's uh, examples of success and, and challenges and opportunities in each of your talks about international collaboration <coughs> and international diplomacy. How would you rate the effectiveness of the collaboration over the seafloor mapping under UNCLOS so far in terms of the Arctic? Take that? Yes, um, I'd rate it, uh, I'd give it good marks for the following reason. As I think Christina was trying to highlight, the Law of the Sea Convention sets out a process for figuring out how far out a country's continental shelf extends. And there are some 50 or 60 countries around the world who are in that process right now figuring out what pieces of seafloor beyond 200 miles from their shore qualify as their so-called extended continental shelf. Um, now, some of those pieces of seafloor can be claimed by two or more countries, that's to say, the areas overlap. And there, what is needed are maritime boundaries. The countries in question need to negotiate a line separating um, the areas claimed by one from the areas claimed by the other. And while these are difficult to do, they are fought over not by gunships, but by oceanographers, cartographers, geologists, diplomats. In the middle of the Arctic Ocean, virtually all of that pocket that's beyond 200 miles from any of the five countries is probably going to wind up as one country's uh, extended continental shelf. We don't know exactly how that process is going to play out right now. But it will be a peaceful one, and it will be an orderly and um, uh, one you know, based on rules already agreed. So I'm not, uh, as, as problems in the world go, this one strikes me as uh, one where countries are going to be cooperating very well on. Yeah, I would just add, it's not a land grab. It is envisioned within the Law of the Sea Convention itself that this is what countries do. Um, the only issue is that there's no real mechanism for resolving boundary disputes. And that wasn't envisioned in the process of actually determining your boundaries. There's a bunch of geologists who look at that, and they don't necessarily take one precedent to the other. So there's some problems, but at least it is a rational process for trying to determine this that can be enhanced through scientific exploration. Yes, just to add to this dilemma or challenges, though, we all know the recent case that's going on near Indonesia and all there where the Chinese have come in and presumably are dumping a lot of crown and beginning to claim a territory. So they're actually changing not the sea, but the land, yes. which then affects whether or not they yes. can do that. And then just in general, when we talk about the big data, which actually has to be seen as a kind of resource for uh, doing science and policy, and also just even legal resources many of the smallest countries, it seems to me, who are in the quote, you know, developing country thing, are coastal countries. So this puts them in a particularly uh, poor position. And a few years ago, um, a friend of mine, actually, who had been with the Coast Guard, helped to develop a, a, an NGO which was designed to service some of these for maritime issues, mainly for commercial things, not this. Mm -hmm. but, um, it just pointed out that there's there's a huge, there are huge gaps where they some of these small coastal areas countries sovereign areas do not have the resources to actually manage legalities or certainly not big data and I'm wondering if this kind of challenge is being addressed and you know working up to resolve some. Issues. Well, I'd say the Commonwealth Institute, for example, has been assisting all the. English speaking nations, yeah. small island states, in defining their maritime boundaries, sort of, you know, what is your baseline, your coastal baseline, and from that you can start to say, this is my 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone, and they even have an organization, the Pacific, that is helping on the ge geology to define what is your out outer continental shelf and submitting those claims. Um, some countries ideally can go through the, the UN, the, there are assistance programs on that. Um, yeah, but a lot of these issues in ocean management um, are a huge problem for the big ocean states or the small island states. 
And um, they're some of the first who see the importance of better managing the high seas, too, because they don't view the ocean as something that divides them, but rather as something that connects them all. And being able to better manage fishery resources in the high seas could enhance their ability to manage them in exclusive economic zones, at least the scientific information, the managerial expertise, <coughs> diplomatic training, all of those things would be hugely beneficial. I'd just add that I'm not exactly sure about the maritime issue, but I know around health issues, very often international uh, aid organizations or bilateral organizations include strong capacity building components around analytic methods. And uh, th there's a strong priority in developing countries to develop the capacity to tabulate and manage and analyze their, their own data. I'm not sure if that goes on with maritime issues as well, but in health it certainly does. That's one of the most um, controversial areas of this new high seas treaty, at least for some countries, has been sort of the, the desire from developing countries for the access and benefit sharing of marine genetic resources. And um, that is, they have a desire, some of the countries have a desire to develop their own industry, basically a biotechnology industry, at least to be able to process some of the material that's coming through, the sequences and such, so that they have the um, technological um, team, if you will, skills and, and um, talent to be able to compete in this growing field. Other countries just sort of see it, I'm never gonna be able to catch up, I would love to get some money out of anything that is coming out of these discoveries. Um, so it's a question of really trying to say, what is the money to be used for? Is it to be used for capacity building and technology transfer? Then is there some other way to make sure that that becomes um, an effective tool to assist these countries in better managing their resources? No. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Dai. Um, I'm really fascinated by this concept of all the big data and the fact that we're here for accumulating data that we haven't necessarily mined it yet. Is there a race right now for you know which country has the best data mining systems? Is it like industry or is it government or is it more of a collaboration? Well, it, I, I wouldn't exactly say it's a collaboration. Again, uh, big data can span a huge area, and I think every country um, is seeing this as part of a strategic, uh, a strategic move for themselves, just to better understand their own data. Um, around different topics, there is collaboration. I think genetics is, is one of the areas, particularly um, where there's a lot of collaboration, a lot of cooperation, uh, but I'm not too familiar with many other big data collaborations on an international scale. Yes, please. I'm curious if you uh, could speak to a pathway where uh, there could be more scientists or more people involved in the International Seabed Authority, the commission that you were talking about, you're saying right now, that is, uh, there are very few people with like, scientific expertise that are on there, maybe from the more general science field. Do you know? Uh, two ways. One is there's going to be elections for the Legal and Technical Commission in 2016. The, the states that are members, parties to the Law of the Sea Convention, unfortunately not the United States, can nominate people to be part of this and they do want them to be expert in some aspect of seabed mining, but it can certainly be in the um, ecology and biology of, of seabed uh, creatures. Uh, that's, so governments can nominate experts, and then also some scientists have started something called the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative to try to involve a greater number of scientists. Many had experience in the census of marine life, deep sea activities, but trying to recruit new members and to start grappling with some of these issues, having workshops on specific topics, uh, organizing one on strategic environmental management planning for the Atlantic region that's looking at hydrothermal vents and their systems across the, the ocean, but it's open to other types of activities, other scientists, and then ideally getting a seat for the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative and other scientific organizations at the International Seabed Authority itself. So I'm happy to talk more about that. Dave, you mentioned the uh, precautionary principle. Precautionary approach. Approach. Precautionary approach. And you also mentioned the challenge of uh, bringing in uh, other 
uh, states because of the, the challenge of only being able to re regulate activities of their own nationals in, the, in terms of this international area. Yeah. Um, how can, in terms of these two questions, is there a role that you can see where the scientific community could facilitate, enhance, or um, uh, in some way bring in the international players to um, recognize their responsibility to regulate activities of their own nationals um, in this precautionary period? That's happening already, at least in one sense. Um, the process I described where the nations surrounding this high seas pocket have been trying to develop policy has been um, uh, part of a two-track approach, the other track being scientific meetings. I mean, we just hosted a third such conference of fishery scientists to focus on these areas took place in Seattle. Kelly, Chris, who's in the audience, was uh, attended that for us. And we included for the first time scientists from a number of other countries to try to get them invested in this process and hopefully to bring back to their respective governments um, some sense of what's going on here and uh, try to help us engage with the, their policy counterparts in China, Japan, Korea, Iceland, et cetera. So a follow on to that, in terms of the precautionary approach, um, presumably there's a sufficiency of information that's involved in some states. Yes. Uh, is there a sense of what, what, what would be sufficient? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I would only have a layperson's answer for that. Um, if, if a commercial fishery were to start up in a part of the ocean that had never known it before, I would want to know uh, what the potential effects are on the stock or stocks being harvested, on um, stocks that might be caught incidentally in the, in the course of it, what the effects might be on the benthos itself. Um, and uh, right now, we don't know any of that. Uh, so we're a long way from sort of uh, even some minimal level of adequate information uh, for fishing to start in this area. Can I just add, yeah, I mean, the, the scary thing is that the fisheries for deep sea bottom fish, like orange ruffy, previously known as slime head, developed in the 1960s and 70s by the Soviet Union and um, others really with out any knowledge of the ecosystems of life history patterns or the consequences of these um, fisheries. And so as a result, we have a huge number of denuded seamounts. We have a huge number of collapsed fish stocks. Uh, these fish happen to aggregate. They happen to live to be over 140 years old. And all of this information came out after the fishery had exploded. And so now there's... Had crashed. Had crashed, yeah. That's what we don't want to have happen. And that's what we don't want to happen. The same thing happened in the Southern Ocean where they basically fished out the ice fish before they were able to get the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Living Room Resources in place. So we've learned many hard lessons about how not to manage a fishery. And so the precaution that's being exhibited in the Arctic is really admirable, but also necessary. Other questions? Yes, please. Very quickly, yeah, at that, so were you saying, Ambassador, that the four or five nations at that uh, meeting were on board with yes, uh, with control of that area? Did they sign some piece of papers? <laughs> there was issued from the uh, meeting in Nuke, Greenland in February of 2014 a chairman's statement outlining those um, commitments. I was the chairman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the notion after that was that we would then, but because it was just a statement by the chairman, it didn't, well, it was carefully negotiated among everybody, it didn't necessarily commit everyone to do just that in uh, anything more than a, I would say, a moral sense. But the idea was we were going to create uh, a declaration that the five governments would actually sign, reflecting all those commitments. Um, but a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. This took place in February of 2014. Problems in Ukraine occurred later that spring. We have not been able to get the five governments together uh, to sign this declaration, and that is um, sort of an intermediate step we need to take, in the view of some, 
before we can have the larger meeting that, uh, involving other countries that I, I wish to have. Uh, however, I will be going to Moscow in a couple of weeks, and one of my uh, things on my list of things to do there is see if I can break this free in Moscow and get us at a place where we can sign this declaration. Would it be helpful to use that the lack of definition around the precautionary approach as a, as a starting point that the, the countries themselves would help to frame an understanding of what the precautionary approach actually is? Well, at least in respect to fisheries, Paul, I would say there is a very well understood sense of what it means. And it's in the UN Fish Stocks Agreement. There is um, uh, a, a set of ideas built into the main body of the agreement, and there's an annex to the Fish Stocks Agreement that lays out the use of precautionary reference points on the sorts of things that are specific to fisheries management. So I think, at least in that context, it's pretty well understood. Maybe not always in all other contexts. Christina may have a different view of this, I don't know. Uh, that's, well, how to operationalize it, even when you have this guidance, is always a question. But it is, I would agree, it is pretty well spelled out at least what the minimum criteria should be. So what comes to mind is, is the Peruvian anchovy fishery. We had regulation limits, and then we had the consequences of El Nino, which depleted the amount of nutrients available, weren't sufficient plankton, the fishery collapsed at the levels that had been agreed on. And in the Arctic, with the changing sea ice cover, the system itself is <coughs> dynamic. Yeah. And so presumably there's the, the potential for some type of unexpected environmental response that even with sufficient information about fish stocks would cause any catch quotas to be well beyond what the system could sustain. I think we simply don't know what the system can sustain right now. And if the precaution approach means anything, it is you need to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you need to know what the carrying capacity of a uh, human fishery is and what the effects of the fishery are on other marine organisms and the benthos itself, and we simply don't know that yet. And the frightening thing about climate change and ocean acidification is that the whole ocean is changing rapidly, yes, too. The Arctic is the most visible uh, manifestation of it, but we really have not come to grips with where the species are going, how they're going to be stressed. I mean, we do know that their um, ocean habitat for high oxygen species like tuna and marlin is being compressed because the ocean is containing less oxygen in certain areas. Uh, that's as it expands um, from the warmth. And so we need big data to start you know, trying to identify what these trends, what the likelihoods of migration is going to be, who's going to thrive in what places, how are they going to deal with an invasive species. The whole ocean is really up for not grabs, but for greater unknowns and greater abrupt changes which is why you sort of want to get science out in the forefront. Yes, please. Uh, I don't know how to phrase this, but uh, in, in your work, what are the countries that you've found have been most guided by the science? Um, and if you feel comfortable, which are the ones that haven't? And where does the US fall on this, on this scale? <laughs> <laughs> This is on tape. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk after. There are a range of views. Okay. Okay. And sometimes it depends on which forum yeah, you are in. Okay. Okay. We can leave there, even at that, it's not a simple question to answer. Okay. You can be candidly. It varies pretty greatly. I will say the US is among those that has access to some of the best science. And the scientific establishments in the United States are world class. Um, and if we don't always follow the science, we don't have a good excuse for not doing so. Other questions, please. Christina, and you've identified a treaty that you're developing for the high seas. Uh, not me. Yes. Well, I mean, are <laughs> involved, involved, no, I think, involved uh, with. It, this is compatible with the discussions that are going on in the Arctic as well, Dave? There's nothing inconsistent about this. The, the uh, effort that Christina is describing would apply to all areas of the world's ocean beyond national jurisdiction, both the water column and the seafloor. And what we're trying to do in the Arctic would be wholly consistent with that. Indeed, the agreement that is being developed in New York would apply to the Arctic as it applies, as it would apply to everywhere else. Yeah, um, I think we're trying to set a, co a common stage 
for cooperation that's with a common understanding of principles of operating procedures, sort of minimum baseline standards for environmental impact assessments, so you don't have new activities like ocean geoengineering popping up that are not subject to any sort of assessment process. Um, establishing mechanisms for developing systems of marine protected areas and not just sort of the one-off icons, if you will, in the Southern Ocean or the Northeast Atlantic, but actually trying to create this interconnected representative network of marine protected areas that's going to help maintain these ecosystem structures, functions, and processes despite the overarching ocean changes. Is that Other, a mouthful? That's a mouthful. <laughs> Other questions? Um, as, a, as a concluding question for each of you to perhaps address, um, Tim, you've identified data diplomacy as a component. And Christina, you talked about areas beyond national jurisdiction, and, and Dave, you talked about the, the Arctic high seas and, and fisheries. Um, is there, for each of you, is, how would you frame science diplomacy in the context of solving the problems that you've identified? Well, I mean, just <laughs> from my perspective, I see science diplomacy as a wider construct of uh, action, um, uh, policy development, collaboration, uh, using science as, as part of that mechanism. Data diplomacy is a specific, um, it specifically relates to Data, databases, technology, um, as a part of that process. But I, I see science diplomacy as a much wider process. It doesn't, and I don't think all science diplomacy necessarily is based on science. I think science is part of it, and it can shape how decisions get made. But we know decisions aren't always made exclusively based on science. Maybe they shouldn't. So, um, you know, data diplomacy focuses very specifically on data and access to data, what type of data exists, what type of analyses are done. Christine. Um, well, I'd say we need, one, a shared understanding of why we should care about the oceans beyond national jurisdiction. We have that pretty much now at the United Nations, but I don't think it's shared as widely as it should be outside the basement corridors of the United Nations plus the delegates change every three years, and so you need to continually renew that. So science is absolutely vital to informing those discussions. We need science to inform the decisions that are made by the sectoral bodies or in the design of systems and marine protected areas. And um, science that can help cross national boundaries and national interests to build that shared understanding, at least amongst the, the scientific community, and that can bridge into capacity building, technology transfer, and non-material, non-monetary benefit sharing for all. Paul, um, one of your first slides showed um, a lot of different facets of science diplomacy. I thought all of those are valid, all those resonate, and all those are part of my work mm -hmm. and the work of my colleagues. But I work in the Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science at the State Department, so I have some sense of this. Um, in the specific field of fisheries, man international fisheries management, it is long established that the decisions must be based on the best available science that's written into the Law of the Sea Convention and every agreement since has said the same thing. So, on some level, science and policy, or at least science and management, are firmly intertwined, at least on the written page. But they're all always followed in practice, is, is the question. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists for their excellent, thoughtful presentations, for the time that they went and prepared them, and for the, the questions that were stimulated by those, those presentations. Um, so please extend a warm congratulations to you.